Welcome everyone, Christine here with a discussion about the Chaos Dwarves and their campaign mechanics. All you need to know in order to play their campaigns. Now I'll make some more dedicated videos for certain aspects of their campaigns, but here I'm just going to do a broad video talking about all the elements in their campaign, from diplomacy to economy, research, the conclave influence system, all of that. But let me first answer the question, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask this. Are the Chaos Dwarves powerful? Well, both yes and no. They are powerful in the sense that they have a lot of potential in their campaign through research, through conclave influence, that they can gain a lot of power in the long term in their campaign. But early on, they're going to be in some serious trouble, especially in Immortal Empires. So they're strong, but they do basically start with an endgame crisis from turn one, and that endgame crisis is called Grimgore. Now, I've defeated Grimgore, though saying you've defeated Grimgore when he still has settlements is a bit optimistic because Grimgore has the ability of recruiting units very very quickly like by the time I actually move on Gorger Rock in this particular situation Grimgore will actually be able to recruit more units uh, maybe even like over half a stack and then he has these uh, settlements over here so he'll get quite a few more units to throw against me so Grimgore is going to feature heavily in all the Chaos Dwarf campaigns and he is a, an absolute powerhouse and here's the thing Creative Assembly has buffed him. Yes, they took one of the most powerful legendary lords in the game who routinely builds a massive empire, especially on high difficulties, and they made him stronger. But how did they make him stronger? Well, they changed the start position from Saber Mountain into Eagle Eries. Now, here's the problem. They gave him a tier 2 settlement over here. Now, a tier 2 settlement, what does that mean? It means he can get nasty skulkers very quickly. It means he can eventually get night goblins and orc biggins and night goblin archers fairly quickly in his campaign. It also means he can get trolls and shamans and all that very quickly in his campaign. Like, the worst situation that can happen in your campaign is Grimgore just deciding to build this troll structure very quickly and just dominating every faction around him. So Grimgore, which I'll talk about probably in a separate video, how his situation is right now, but Grimgore is quite a bit more powerful at the moment in Immortal Empires than he was uh, previously. And he was already a powerhouse. Now, of course, he does have three legendary lords or two legendary lords over here, one in Astrogoth and the other one in Zeta and the Black. But you're actually going to have a serious problem dealing with Grimgore in your campaign. And you can expect him to throw multiple stacks at you uh, very quickly. I think in this campaign so far, by turn 31, I've already dealt with four full stacks of troops with wands attached to them. Now, you can win those battles, but damn, that is a brutal early game situation to throw at the cast dwarf. So, their early game is limited. It, but it's not just limited because of Grimgore, it's also limited because of their mechanics. They have good units, but their good units are um, restricted by um, armaments and by unit capacity. Now you can get a lot of these good units later on in a campaign, but early on you're going to be significantly more limited. You still have all the tools to succeed, but it isn't going to be a cakewalk of a campaign, especially when you start factoring in diplomacy. Touch on the diplomatic angle with the cast dwarves. They hate each other. They have a minus 15 aversion. It is not a major problem in your campaign, but it can be an issue, and we all know how on higher difficulties the AI factions are very aggressive against the players. Now, in all the campaigns I fought, I haven't ended up in a war with fellow cast dwarves, though I believe it could happen. The Dark Elves um, have the best aversion against you of minus 10. Yes. The Dwarves have a minus 100 aversion. Cafe, um, uh, Cafe has a minus 40. The Greenskins have minus 100. And basically, virtually all the factions, with the exception of Chaos, utterly despise you in one way or another. Kislev, interestingly enough, has a, only a minus 40 aversion. But still, minus 40 is still pretty substantial. Only Chaos gets along well with, uh, with them. And even then, uh, they're just neutral towards you. They don't particularly like you either. Hilarious part is that the Skaven also have a minus 20 aversion against the Chaos Dwarves. When the Skaven hate you, you know you're a diabolical faction. Like, if the Skaven are like, whoa, these guys are way too hardcore even for us, yeah, the Chaos Dwarves are absolute uh, pricks, really, considering the things they do. But they are, by the way. In the lore, in the game, they are absolutely terrible. 
uh, terrible as people in a lot of very significant um, significant ways. So that's that's something to bear in mind. Everyone hates you, and that means that your campaign is going to involve a lot of wars against virtually all of your neighbors, with the exception of the factions of chaos. So you've got Gorse, you've got Emmerich here in the Plane of Bones over here, like I'm playing this campaign as Turn 31 as Drazov. I took out Emmerich, Tretch, uh, and Tretch very quickly. I made, uh, I sold some territory to Gorse, so I may have picked the wrong horse to support in the fight, so to speak, because it seems like Rhesus is winning that fight, though it kind of makes sense. The problem with Rhesus in his campaign is the fact that uh, Grimgor comes in from the north, smashes him up at about the same time that... Um, that Gors is smashing him up. So, because Gre uh, Grimgor hates you a lot more than he hates, uh, hates Greasus, he's likely going to declare war on you far more likely than he is going to declare war on Greasus. You can probably make some deal with Greasus. But then, of course, you've got Greenskins to the west over here, and then, of course, Karakadrin and Fulgrim um, to the west as well. Hell, the best situation you could have in this campaign is if Skarsenik somehow manages for some miracle to defeat Fulgrim, but even then, he's going to come for you after that and then you have the bloody hands which have also declared war on me so it is a fun situation diplomatically speaking and it is the chaos dwarves especially when you consider the fact that as the chaos dwarves believe it or not you do actually want a good deal of co cooperation in your campaign so you don't just care about your own fashion your own little corner you actually care about the other religion lords as well the reason you care about the other religion lords as well is because of the Tower of Tsar. Now, I'll talk about this in greater detail in just a bit, but suffice it to say, the districts can be acquired by you or by the other legendary lords of the Chaos Dwarfs. Now, it's very possible when you're playing the Chaos Dwarfs to get a lot of these seats yourself, especially the more powerful ones, like looking here, I've got five seats myself, six seats even. So I've been able to get six seats, whereas the other factions have gotten two and three respect, uh, well, three each of them. So I'm way ahead of these guys, but these seats are important because of the district benefits that they give you. So basically keeping the other Chaos Dwarf Legendary Lords alive is important, especially when you can confederate them at the highest tier with uh, the Conclave. And once you get to the Conclave tier, which is basically tier four in the Tower of Tsar. You also care about Empire because um, you do have Tsarna Grund, which is an amazing settlement or an amazing province that you can get. So if you're playing a Chaos Dwarf campaign, you basically care about the entire Chaos Dwarf Empire. Empire, take note. This is what Carl Franz's campaign should be like. Like some territory you care about, but then also caring about the welfare of the Empire, but also having all of the tools needed to do so. Because you do have the tools to actually care to actually protect the entire Empire, and you get benefits for doing so. As Carl Franz, you're just running around like a hellish chicken trying to keep the Empire alive constantly worrying about imperial authority, constantly getting annoyed, and then having to spend that imperial authority just to confederate a bunch of shitty factions. This is not the case with the Chaos Dwarves. You don't confederate shitty factions. You confeder confederate powerful factions that give you significant benefits in your campaign. And you also get benefits by those factions staying alive because they'll use their own conclave influence in order to get seats on the Tower of Tsar. So this works substantially better as uh, as an imperial campaign, far better than the actual imperial campaign for the Empire of Man works at the moment in the game. You have a common threat that's a major problem. You have several common threats. You have dwarves, you have greenskins, and you have to deal with those, and you have to engage in jo jolly cooperation in order to deal with those threats. That's the key thing to know when we're talking about diplomacy of the Chaos Dwarves. Now with that in mind, let's talk about the Chaos Dwarf economy. How does it function? What kind of resources you're going to use? They took the resource system from Troy, a Total War Saga. Troy tweaked it and implemented it in Warhammer 3 for the Chaos Dwarf. So you have your usual gold, which is spent mainly on recruiting units, but also on getting certain structures, specifically the structures in uh, the in the raw material production. So you have three di different types of settlements. You have the towers, you have the factories, and you also have the outposts. Now, how do outposts work in terms of um, construction is that in order to construct things in uh, in an outpost, you need gold, a lot of gold. Like even here, even though I have some construction cost benefits over here in the campaign, it's still 5k gold to get uh, this to tier three. 
But outposts also require the labor force in order to function. Like there's a bunch of buildings in your Chaos Dwarf Empire that will require a certain number of workers in order to function. And you'll always lose workers every turn, especially if you are at a low level of public order. So, in, so maintaining good public order is important because you're going to lose less workers. Maintaining a huge amount of workers is important in order to get a bunch of raw materials. Now, raw materials, what they're needed for is to maintain your factories because factories, your assembly line, which produces armaments, or the gold refinery produce a lot of gold or armaments, but they need a certain amount of raw materials every turn. And then you also have towers. Towers as the provincial capitals the main resource on towers is um, raw materials. So in order to get to a higher tier, you don't have a growth system, you have a limit of raw materials. Like getting a high level tower is very, very expensive, especially early on when you have a very significant cost and you haven't gotten the construction cost benefits that you can get later on in your campaign. But suffice it to say, raw materials are important for many, um, for many buildings in your empire, but not only buildings. Military buildings, like the base military buildings, just require gold, but the advanced military buildings require armaments. That's the purpose of armaments. They're used to construct these advanced military buildings, but they're also used in the Hellforge in order to increase unit caps, so from Dwarf Warriors, Infernal Guard, all these units, and also giving them significant benefits. So you shouldn't worry too much about the benefits over here, because this has an upkeep of armaments. Basically, the way I would see these benefits in the Hellforge and the Manufactory is benefits you can use from like the mid game into the late game in order to really substantially improve your units but first you also need to increase the unit caps in order to even be able to get some of these benef benefits but these benefits are immense when we're looking at your units like you can get frenzy for your melee units glittering scales to reduce melee attacks thundering attacks to uh, reduce the armor of units physical resistance fear and a bunch of other things. Like, for instance, the big uh, big unit that the Chaos Dwarves do have, of course, is the Kadai Destroyer. Well, you can give a barrier, which is absolutely ridiculous in your campaign. Also, your hero capacity depends on buildings that require armaments. So, you need, uh, you need towers, of course, to produce units. You need raw materials to get those towers. And you also need armaments from factories. The factories also requiring raw materials. Like all of the buildings or the majority of the buildings in a factory uh, settlement, with exception like the garrison buildings, but all the other buildings, uh, like the main buildings over here uh, in the infrastructure chain, all require raw materials. So you have a balancing act between raw materials, between gold, raw materials, and armaments in your campaign. And you also need a labor force in order to maintain uh, these buildings. Now, let's talk a bit about the labor force because you can use labor for other things as well. You can use labor, you can consume some of the labor that you're getting in a province. So for instance here, I have an abundance of labor. Let's just transfer it over here. Um, though I, I believe I've used all of the... Um, all of the all of the labor actions, but you can get some conclave influence, money, and and or control for five turns. So conclave influence and money will have a one turn cooldown, so you can keep spamming it. Though labor is limited, it's not like a situation where you're playing the dark elves and you just get a significant amount of slaves every single battle. No, in this particular case, you are going to get a decent amount. You can increase it even further, but you're also going to have to be careful and strategic with regards to your decisions. Getting a lot of raw materials early on sounds great, but I would not necessarily dedicate the province to the production of raw materials or factories, at least not early on in the campaign. Later on, that's a bit of a different discussion, though there's always benefits in terms of having diversity in a particular province. For instance, a factory does have the tools manufactory, manufactory so if you have one you in, in like a province that has like two or three uh, mine shafts um, or underground caverns, you can actually produce quite a bit more raw materials. And you're also not going to spend a mountain of gold. So you can't just go in full on with, uh, with outposts because you just don't have the gold for it. You'll also need the gold to produce units. So you need to, like, you need to do what I've done here. Like, for instance, the first um, uh, settlement that I took in this campaign, I put as an outpost the second settlement in, um, in the Darkhold, I put down as a factory.
um, factory, which in turn gave me armaments and crucially gold. Now I'm producing quite a lot of armaments, a decent amount of armaments, and also a pretty decent amount of raw materials by this point in the campaign. But that's the key to know about the campaign. You need laborers to maintain raw material production, then you need to use those raw materials and maintain production of raw, uh, of raw materials in order to keep your factory working, in order to get your armaments working, in order to get higher level units and also upgrade them. Another thing that you use all these materials for, be it gold, raw materials, um, armaments, or rather gold and armaments, uh, what you're also using it for is caravans, convoys. So typically speaking, you don't, you can't sell your raw materials, but you can sell your armaments in order to get things like laborers or gold, or you can, uh, or even uh, raw materials. Like you can sell either gold or armaments, and you can get laborers. You can get, uh, you can get laborers. You can get gold. You can get raw materials, depending on where you're sending them. I would say the convoy system is always also a balancing act. Like you do want convoys to be running around the map. But sometimes, uh, especially when you get into the very late game, you might realize that it's actually not necessarily quite as useful as you might realize to continuously trade resource, resources. Though constantly having a stream of uh, laborers coming into your empire can be very beneficial. The reason it's so very beneficial is because you can use the laborers to get conclave influence in your empire. With that in mind, let's talk about conclave influence. How do you gain it? How do you spend it? Well, the main way of gaining conclave influence is for using the labor actions over here. So you get an abundance of laborers in all of your provinces and you spend 200 of them every turn potentially unless you have to use the control commandment to keep control in check. You do want to keep control in check because if you're not keeping it in check you're, go you're, going, you're always going to use, lose laborers every turn but if you have strong control it can be very little. If you have poor control it can be a very substantial amount. So bear in mind. I've never actually faced a rebellion playing the Chaos Dwarf campaigns, and I've played a number of them so far. I haven't ever faced a rebellion, but you do want to maintain good control when you're talking about the Chaos Dwarf. So balancing out between getting gold from laborers, getting conclave uh, influence, or maintaining control is uh, is something you're going to have to do. And on top of that, on top of that, you always need to maintain a certain number of laborers in every single province that uh, that you have as part of your empire in order to keep the buildings working or else your uh, raw material production is going to slow down if that slows down if that halts then your armament production is going to go down your gold production your economy can collapse so you do need to be careful about your economy if you're playing the cast dwarves but mainly the way you're gaining conclave influence is for labor actions you can also gain some passively through settlement building so main settlement buildings can give you a bit of conclave influence, like one for a factory, um, potentially one for an outpost tower. There's research that does improve it. And then also for like the towers themselves, they also generate conclave influence. They're the main generators of conclave influence, passive conclave influence. And you also have the Temple of Ashut, which can give you extra conclave influence, though it's a tier 5 structure. And to be honest, by the time you get... Uh, you get to that point that's just not worth um, getting because by that point you're likely going to have all the other seats and you can get a lot of conclave influence very quickly if you're not if you're careful if you're aggressive in expanding if you get a lot of laborers and you spend out laborers to to get the conclave influence now what do you spend conclave influence on well you spend it out two, two things the one of the things you can use is to get towers like when you're occupying a settlement a provincial capital like when it's a minor settlement you can either build an outpost or a factory but when it's a provincial capital you can still make a factory or an outpost or you can make a tower now towers will always be gained at tier one unless you're using conclave influence to get it to a higher tier but i would not do this early on in a campaign hell i probably wouldn't do it in the entire campaign unless I've sorted out things in the Tower of Tsar. But it is one of the things you can use Conclave Influence for. Another thing you can use Conclave Influence for is the research in sorcery. Like military requires armaments, industry requires raw materials, but uh, Conclave Influence can be spent on some research. Like for instance, the malicious compliance, which gives you two control and 10% casualties. So 10% casualties means more laborers. So that can be useful. But um, 
but those are two of the main ways you can spend them on. Uh, you can spend Conclave Influence on a campaign map, or you can spend it on districts in the Tower of Tsar. Now, the Tower of Tsar is really all about cooperation, believe it or not. Yes, you can usurp seats from another faction, but the key thing to understand here, and I'll do an entire video because there's a lot of t things to talk about here in the Tower of Tsar, but the thing to understand is you get district benefits all, when all the seats in a district are occupied, all of you get uh, fa faction-wide benefits. So, for instance, the industrial district gives you raw materials output 5% and armaments output 5%. So, the, industri the industrial districts generally are the best, as far as I see it, because at Tier 2, you get more convoys. At Tier 3, you get free control. The other benefits aren't bad, to be clear, but suffice to say, industry rules. There are some seats like 6% casualty replenishment for the Chaos Dwarves, for all your armies. Uh, for instance, that's very, very useful, or 25 armaments and 5% armament output in military, as well as an army ability over here that you can get. To be fair, I got I only got this army ability because I wanted to unlock the higher tier over here, because the other factions were just being a bit too slow in gaining those seats. Factions can usurp, usurp seats from you, but to be honest, I've rarely seen that happen. Sometimes it has happened, and you can get them back if you want to, though it is going to cost you a fair amount to be able uh, to do so. And it's probably not the best idea to actually spend spend influence to usurp seats to get seats back when you can just get things on a higher tier eventually leading to confederation so you want a lot of conclave influence because you can then confederate all of the um, other legendary lords including the passive faction the servants of the conclave the servants of the conclave start with control of the capital in the plains of czar and the Plains of Tsar, like, it will start at tier, uh, tier 5, the capital itself. I was surprised by this because I actually expect the Tsar Nagrun to be a settlement in its, uh, on its own in its province. But no, the Chaos Dwarves don't care about um, those single settlement provinces. They're kind of worthless for them. So instead, the Plains of Tsar is an actually really good province with an amazing landmark here with the Great Temple of Ashut, which gives you a lot of income, uh, conclave influence per turn, all that kind of good stuff. So confederating them is always useful, though of course confederating the other legendary lords as well is very useful because you then get access to their uh, special skill line. So your priority with the Chaos Dwarves is to get a lot of influence. It's the most important resource uh, possible in the campaign. I would say that whenever you get an event that makes you choose between a war like gold, armaments, materials, or influence, you should always go for influence. And you should always try and push the influence as high as possible. Like this is turn 31 in this campaign. And I've already got uh, six seats here in the Tower of Tsar. And soon enough, I'll have seven seats in this particular campaign. Uh, for instance, going for trafficker to increase a maximum convoy capacity and Lord Recruit rank for convoy overseers. The reason it's important to get higher level convoy overseers from the very start when you recruit them is that you can get maximum cargo capacity and better scales from the very start. And of course, inspiring presence, hidden stores, all that kind of stuff. You shouldn't focus on the military ability of a convoy. Usually you should send them down a route where they shouldn't have to fight major, fi uh, major fights in the first place. So not a very high threat level. Though funnily enough, here over here, like Zarnagrund, all the convoys will start in Zarnagrund. Uh, the nearby area is uh, very, very hostile to me, but other areas, not so much. Um, this will be an important point, by the way. Usually in a lot of campaigns, you can get a lot of money in your in your campaign early on by declaring war on distant factions. One, they've nerfed that by the looks of it. So if I, so if I go over here to the disciples of Shoot and just ask them, hey, let's declare war on, let me declare war on Clan Farrakh, he's barely going to give me any money at this particular point. I think this they've changed that, how that works with distance, though I don't know, we don't have patch notes at the moment. I guess we'll see what those patch notes do include. But yeah, that is their economy in a nutshell, their conclave influence system in a nutshell, and also some of the things to care about convoys. Um, it's a great system, it has a lot of complexity, and uh, honestly, you're not going to be bored playing a Cast Dwarf campaign because there is always things to manage. I would have liked some automation with the slave system or the labor system where, you know, I could click a button and the system itself would spend the gold within certain limits to always balance things out between, uh, between provinces or balance things out when, you know, the effectiveness, the efficiency is below 100%. That would have been great. Because it can be annoying having to ba uh, to manage an entire a massive empire when it comes to that every single turn. But for the most part, it is a great system. It works really well. 
I loved the economic system of A Total or Sayo Troy. I think it was one of the best parts of that entire game. So it's, I'm glad to see it over here. And I think you get a really great campaign when it comes to cooperation between factions because you want them to take the seats on the Tower of Tsar. You want to keep them alive because you can confederate them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great campaign, great campaign mechanics. Now, just to talk about their army roster, though I've done a whole dedicated video on the subject, so I'm not going to repeat myself uh, in that. You can check it out. I'll link it at the end of this one. But from ev every settlement, you can recruit orc laborers and goblin laborers in your campaign. Goblin laborers don't seem especially great, whereas orc laborers can be. Since most of their damage is armor-piercing damage, they're basically the two-hand version of the regular orc boys, though no armor, weak leadership, not the best melee stats, but they will certainly hold their own in a fight, they can be a great distraction for your other units in your army. Also, in every Chaos Dwarf campaign, you'll also start with the drill assembly, basically the giant conveyor into the high-powered drill assembly line, into the Grumrail tip uh, drill assembly line, and this will give you the ability to recruit Chaos Dwarf warriors with great weapons and regular Chaos Dwarf uh, warriors. Then, from Tier 1 settlements, you can also get the Hobgoblin mustering camp, which give you uh, the Hobgoblin Infantry Units. Sneaky Gets in particular are the unit of choice, I think, here. They're pretty good early on. They have poison attacks. They'll stand their own in melee, especially if you have Gordos in, in your army, which he's fairly easy to get, by the way. All you need to do is recruit eight Hobgoblin Units in your armies, and that's about it. Hobgoblin Archers, pretty decent uh, range unit from the very start of your campaign. Do flaming attacks. So those flaming attacks can be useful even in the late game, though their late game potential is more limited. The way I'm seeing the Cast Dwarf situation, the Orc Labors, the Hobgoblins, all that, are really useful in early game, but not so great late game. You also get that the Tier 2 Hobgoblin um, Mustering Camp. You get Wolf Raiders with Spear, so they're a pretty decent light cavalry choice. A good amount of charge, not necessarily the best uh, melee stats, but do have a fair amount of resistance because they do have 45 armor and a bronze shield. Then you have the wolf raiders with bows. They lose the shield, but they're still pretty decent in a fight, though obviously worse than the raiders, but still pretty decent in a fight. Can run around the battlefield shooting at their enemies, and they do flaming attacks, and they can fire while moving. Then you get your uh, Chaos Dwarf, a warrior a barracks basically going all the way into infernal iron swarm at tier four and infernal guard with fire glaives so at tier two you can recruit from this uh cast or warriors and then infernal castellan and then at tier three infernal guard and then finally infernal iron swarm and infernal fire glaives like infernal iron swarm are like iron breakers uh infernal guard are like long beards and long beards with gray weapons and then fire glaives are like they have no comparison with any other unit. They're basically the best gunpowder unit in the game, I think. Uh, just from what I've seen. I'm not sure if there's any other unit that could really compare to them, but I do like these guys. They basically are shooting laser weapons, and that's always very substantial. Pretty decent melee stats, by the way, for the cast dwarf uh, gunpowder units like blunderbusses and, of course, uh, Infernal Guard with fire glaives. Now, blunderbusses are like the Cafean... Iron, gun, uh, iron Hail Gunners, so short range, but do quite a bit of damage, but they they certainly are more expensive. But these guys will melt units if you get that line of sight working. The key is to get that line of sight working in a fight. And yeah, Infernal Guard can be pretty good uh, in a melee fight, though so can be, uh, so, infer uh, so Infernal Iron Sworn can be in a fight as well. And you do get regiments around versions for Blunderbusses, Cast Dwarf Warriors, and, and the Infernal Iron Sworn as well. Then, advanced military-wise, you do get the Centaurs, pretty solid cavalry uh, units, so Centaur, uh, Centaur, Bolt Centaur Renders, Grey Taurus at Tier 2. In Tier 3, you get the Bolt Centaur Renders, Grey Weapons, or Dual Axes. The Dual Axes are an anti-infantry unit, the Grey Weapons are like an anti-cav unit, that's how I'd see it. And then the Lamasu, which is like this flying magical unit that does magical attacks and is good for debuffing heroes and debuffing armies, because they can also negate magical weapons, which is pretty important for an army that has so much armor in it. Whereas the Great Taurus and the Bale Taurus are more useful in a straight-up uh, fight over here. The Great the Bale Taurus has a flaming attack, the Great Taurus does not, uh, and they get, um, they get more effect. They're pretty decently resistant to missiles. All the Centaur units are pretty resistant, or all the Bull units, if you will, are pretty resistant to missile damage and the 
bell towers and gray towers do get more melee benefits, melee damage reflection, physical resistance, the more time they spend in melee. Then looking at artillery at tier two, which is always great to have artillery at tier two, you get magma cannons, uh, iron demons, and skull crackers. Iron demons are basically uh, artillery shotguns, not the greatest range, but still can do a lot of damage if they get in close. Call crackers are like a freight train running around doing a lot of damage. And magma cannons are, honestly, the way I would describe them is they're more of a hell cannon than actual hell cannon is, at least from a lore perspective, because these guys can do quite a bit of damage in uh, in melee as well, which is something that the hell cannon should be known for, because like in the lore, a engaging a hell cannon in melee combat is a really bad idea, because it's a demon. That's not the case with the actual Hell Cannon. Though bear in mind, while the Magma Cannon is powerful, it is only one unit, so it won't do necessarily very well in artillery duels. The way I'd probably use it more effectively, beyond just knocking down walls, is more like bring close in range, shoot at point blank range, do a lot of damage. I mean, it can do a lot of damage from range against static enemies, but the accuracy on the Magma Cannon is not the greatest. The Hell Cannon will actually do better in that respect. Then you get the Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher, so you get a rocket launcher that does... Uh, that has two attacks, like you have a demolition rocket, so for sieges, for single entities, but really for sieges. The Death Shriek rocket fires an explosive that then uh, blows up in a bunch of smaller explosives. So what cluster munitions you have over there, you will like take a poison wind mortar, put it on an artillery piece, double its range, and that's kind of what you get with the Death Shrieker. And then at tier 3, you have, uh, you have the Dreadquake mortar. And then you also get the Iron Demon with the, the pulling a Dreadquake Mortar behind it. That is quite a bit more powerful, but also very, very expensive because you're getting two units for the price of one. But a great deal of power over there. And then you get the Skull Cracker with the Dreadquake Mortar as well. I think the Iron Demon with the Dreadquake Mortar is probably the better choice because melee stats-wise, there's there doesn't seem to be any real difference between the Iron Demon and the Skull Cracker. Though bear in mind, there is an important aspect to talk about here. Uh, between uh, these two units. There is a certain role the Skullcracker has. The Skullcracker has the Wall Breaker ability over here, which means it can take down walls, do a lot of damage, whereas the Iron Demon does not. By the way, these are Hellforge units. So all the units here are Hellforge units, so they can be healed by a Demon Priest, by a hero over here. So all, all of your artillery uh, is Hellforge with the exception of the Hell Cannon for whatever reason anyway. But that's because the Hell Cannon has a bunch of dwarves pulling it, but everything else is Hell Force, so you can heal it up. Then you start talking about the Demon Smithy, like at Tier 2 only you, you can only get heroes, but at Tier 3 you get Kadai Fireborn, and then Kadai Destroyers. These are Fire Demons, so they can uh, be replenished by a Demon Smith, so you probably want to get heroes. And the Kadai Destroyer in particular is a very substantial combat unit, it's unbreakable if its HP is greater than 50%, it gets a lot of resistances. But once it starts going down and its leadership starts suffering, it's going to go down very, very quickly. This is especially the case with the Kadai Fireborn. Like, both Kadai units are pretty powerful in battle. Uh, the Kadai Fireborn basically won't lose, uh, won't lose any, uh, or they won't lose entities very easily as, until their HP starts going down. So that's just one of the things. Like, it's very hard to actually kill a single Kadai Fireborn until their leadership uh, goes down and then they start dying en masse. So you've got to be careful with the demonic units. And that's the unit roster in a nutshell. Again, I've done an entire video on the army roster of the Chaos Dwarfs. Check that out. But you do have some pretty cheap and effective early game units that are not going to do so well necessarily in the late game, I think. Um, but then you have the really powerful units of the Cast Dwarf units. And when it comes to army roster on the campaign, you always got to remember, you can incre you need to increase capacity for the armory, but the more you increase capacity, more upgrades you get for the manufactory. And the manufactory gives you insane benefits for your army. Like your missile infantry can get um, vanguard deployment or spell resistance, stocks, press of fire, reducing speed of enemies, reload time reduction, mal magical attacks, extra powder for more damage extra reload for uh, replenishing ammunition, which, by the way, Rattling Gunners have for Ica Claw's campaign. Or artillery, well, artillery can be pretty damn ridiculous as well. So you can put barrier on your artillery, which is pretty amazing, I think. Like, pretty damn amazing in a lot of respects. So you do have a lot of power uh, over here for the Hellforge. So keep in mind, you do need to pay armaments every turn uh, over here. So this is the 
this is how much it costs you to get this upgrade. But if you do get this upgrade, for instance, over here, if I get reload, this is telling me this is how much I am going to have to pay in terms of the armament upkeep uh, in my campaign, like Hellforge upkeep. And that's just for the units I currently have. You can spend a lot of armaments um, in your campaign pretty easily. I will not necessarily get the unit upgrades until I have a substantial armament production because you do need armaments to get these buildings in the first place. You also uh, need uh, need armaments to get the unit capacity. I'd prioritize capacity, I'd prioritize getting buildings as opposed to the manufacturing early on, but once you get the manufacturing belt benefits, they are substantial, I believe. And that's pretty much it to talk about the Chaos Dwarves. I'll talk about the Legendary Lords and their campaigns in a future video, their campaign situation, but in a lot of ways, the way I'm seeing it, like you're always going to have to deal with Grungor regardless of where you're starting, like as Astrogoth here in the north or Drazov here in the south or as Zaytan here in the east, you're always going to have to deal with the green menace that is Grimgor, and then you're going to have to deal with all the other enemies. So yeah, that is the Chaos Dwarf uh, situation, campaign situation in a nutshell, just very broadly speaking. I'll talk about the specifics of each individual campaign in future videos. I'll talk about the Tower of Zar in its own video. But yeah, I do like them. I do actually like them quite a, uh, quite a bit, but... Uh, it's up to you guys to make your own conclusions on that subject. Cosine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.